Welcome to The Happy Doc. My name is Taylor Brana. In this podcast and related website, thehappydoc.com, the goals are to inspire, develop knowledge, and provide tools to enhance your creativity, joy, and success as a health professional. Our guests provide their stories, tips, mindset, and much more, which have allowed them to succeed in such a demanding field. Our next guest is Dr. Patty Barrett, who is a trained interventional cardiologist. He is also the host and creator of The Doctor Paradox, a podcast which is committed to addressing the issues of burnout in healthcare and understanding how to make it better. He has worked internationally, practicing in Ireland, Sydney, New York, and San Diego. His work has been featured in Time Health, Business Week, the New York Academy of Sciences, the New England Journal of Medicine, and many other media outlets and journals. This interview with Dr. Barrett discusses the many aspects of finding joy and satisfaction in a career in healthcare, and ultimately the importance of taking back control of your life. Please enjoy this very wise next guest, Dr. Patty Barrett. My name is uh, Paddy Barrett. I'm a cardiologist and clinician scholar at Scripps Translational Science Institute in San Diego, California. Amazing. And, and thank you so much for being with me today. The first thing that really inspired me to reach out to you is the fact that you have this amazing podcast called The Doctor Paradox. Can you explain that to the listeners? The Dr. Paradox podcast um, is really around two uh, major tenets. One is understanding um, the increasing and worrying trend of primarily physician burnout and the mental health issues associated with working in healthcare today. And secondly, how we will make that better. Um, so that really has been a, a kind of a journey for me. I've learned an immense amount. Um, and that's really kind of what, what the podcast uh, is about. About. Additionally, in that, we, we cover lots of interesting and novel medical careers, things that people uh, may not have considered. Um, and you hear people's stories, and although they may end up in various different places, um, everyone's core journey is, is effectively the same, and everyone uh, has gone through challenging or difficult times. Um, so it's, it's not unusual uh, to see that in people's past as a physician. That's amazing and, and absolutely commendable. It's it's something obviously I have seen, which is why I created you know this podcast and something you have seen. And, and to find these solutions and to apply them is is a really great thing that you have created. So, what commonalities you describe this journey that common journey? What commonalities have you found while doing your your research and your learning through these other physicians? I think the first thing is that. When you are in the earlier parts of your career, you tend to look at your, your seniors, the attendings, other people around you, and everyone seems to be doing fantastic. Um, but when you scratch under the surface, you'll find that a lot of people went through this um, challenging time, either during their, say, medical school training, internship, residency, attending, and even retirement periods. And it's, it's incredibly common. Um, but it's something that is not talked about. So when you, you peel back these layers, um, you find that people are, tend not to disclose this. And because of that, there is somewhat of a perception that it is something that doesn't exist amongst their peers and colleagues. And it is a feeling and a journey that people are going through individually. Um, and when we hear the figures quoted on physician burnout or depression or whatever you want to uh, look at in terms of the metrics of our happiness and engagement as a clinician group, it tends not to match up with what you see uh, to a large degree in, in personal experience. You'll see pockets of it, but these figures quoted of 50% don't seem to, to, to match up. And there's there's obviously some statistical nuance in that insofar as how burnout is measured and captured um, and it doesn't necessarily imply consistent within a population that just implies that it was measured at one time point. Um, 
but it's 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 important that we we have these conversations and that we understand what the uh, the true causes for it are and it's only when we understand the problem better can we look at addressing it sure absolutely and and so one thing that comes to mind when i hear of burnout and you kind of kind of um mentioned it a little bit is is the fact that it is kind of a hidden thing within the community. So how does one expose themselves, so to speak, or allow that vulnerability? How do we create that sort of dialogue within the community? I think it's it's an issue of having a, a more global conversation or a kind of an individual conversation. And when you speak with your, your friends and colleagues, frankly, um, you will find that... Uh, that you can have these uh, these conversations. One of the more challenging parts of this is is the fact that how physicians reflect on themselves or medical students reflect on themselves if they feel that they're going through a, a period where they're challenged, be it either in terms of this perception of physician burnout or a mental health concern, um, and that they feel that there's a very significant stigma. There's this also issue amongst physicians that we feel that we are invulnerable um, that we don't get the diseases that our patients get. Um, and we tend to avoid disclosing it in terms of how we would be judged by our peers. Um, but in, in close conversations and with, with mentors, um, you will find that this is something that has, has touched pretty much every person during their training. But the understanding the problem is is key here because what you'll see and and have seen um, is this huge growth in in articles and discussion around the idea of physician burnout. Um, additionally, how we are as a group will likely become a performance indicator, and there has been very honorable moves by many medical institutions to try and in this kind of quote unquote sense, cure physician burnout. But what that does is it really speaks to our core principles of as physicians, we look at a pathology and we then treat that pathology. But what we, and certainly I found, and this matches up with the literature is that it's not something that you treat as an individual. So when a hospital system goes about uh, putting in place a physician wellness program, what they put in place is often resisted by the physician group and it is ineffective. And the reason for that is the roots of physician burnout are not within the physicians themselves. It is primarily in the environment in which they work. So if you try and treat or cure the physicians, you really achieve very little. If you actually look at the classic issue uh, would be providing them with uh, resiliency or mindfulness based classes. And while I think these are really critical components as part of the psychological um, toolkit that you have to have available to you, um, they are only useful when layered on top of an understanding of the problem. So the the issue is here is the ecosystem of healthcare that exists has changed very dramatically over the last several decades. And this environment in which people work is what's driving these issues of discontent and dissatisfaction and burnout within the physician community. So trying then to address it by sending someone to a mindfulness class or resiliency training is simply not going to work. So it, it's about the true root cause analysis um, in terms of understanding your problem. And then when you understand the problem, then you can work towards a solution. And what you'll find is, is that some healthcare systems want to, and I said in an honorable sense, address the problem. But when you then have a solution that implies that the problem was with the individual and the individual doesn't get any better, because why would they? Because that's not the actual uh, way to address it you find that the, the onus of responsibility is on the person. And when that doesn't work, they will say, well, we tried and it, it doesn't work. And this is an issue with the individual. But when you actually look at it the other way around and the real cause is with the ecosystem in which they operate. So it's people in a high risk environment. Then the onus of responsibility is on the people who are actually 
providing the environmental structures. And, the, and that gets a lot trickier because now you're looking at institutional organizational change, a cultural shift amongst institutions and, and how people uh, interact with each other and how they interact with their, their roles in general. That's much trickier and that responsibility is now shifted more, not entirely, but more um, on the, the organization. Wow. Yeah. And, and, you know, some things that came to mind as I was listening to you were, you know, the, these mindfulness or resiliency classes essentially being a band-aid for the real problem and us needing to focus on the bigger picture. So have you conceived or seen a healthy or happier environment that doesn't provide this sense of burnout and, and you know, down mood and depression that we have seen? I think you're going to see elements of it everywhere. Um, however, it doesn't mean that it has to be ubiquitous. Um, I've worked on three different continents and you will see it exist in various forms in various healthcare systems. Um, but it doesn't mean that when you're at work, you have to be unhappy. So the key component for me is that if you simply accept that there will be challenges and difficult organizational structures. That's just going to be key. But if you're working and as part of that solution, because we are a part of this system, there's somewhat a, a tendency to, to blame everything on this quote unquote system and a healthcare amorphous system that we simply can't control. But we are part of that system too. So we have to be part of the solution. Um, and once you feel that you can then, you know, at least attempt to, to influence change, it makes a huge difference in terms of your psychological um, approach to it. What matters most, and, and this is kind of the, the key thing in terms of uh, how you set up an ecosystem, is, is that people feel that they're cared for and heard. People will work incredibly hard. Physicians are not strangers to hard work. Um, but if you have an environment where they feel that they're not appreciated or cared for, it, it doesn't matter how hardworking they are. They will be dissatis dissatisfied with their work. But even in the setting of having long hours, if people feel heard, appreciated and cared for, um, they will enjoy their work. Wow. And uh, I think that's uh, some really great points uh, to think about. How how does one or how do these systems, have you seen it, how do they implement this type of appreciation um, and, and ability to be listened to in their programs? And how do we personally take that ownership to get involved in, in a mission like that? This is fundamentally down to leadership. And when people think of leadership, they, they tend to think of people sitting in some uh, elevated structure away from the clinical floors and not seeing patients. And it's somewhat a, of a tainted word. But in reality, if you are working in healthcare, um, if you're a CEO of a hospital, if you're the head of a department, if you are a fellow, a resident, a medical student, you are playing some leadership role because somebody looks up to you for guidance in what you do and that's important. So ultimately, it's not about a very extensive, complex solution. It's about sitting down with the people whom you are responsible for and asking them and paying a genuine interest in terms of what they're doing, asking them if they're okay, and maybe how we can work better. With that as a cultural ethos in place, the solutions will naturally find their way. There is no one size fits all to this problem because the individual drivers of dissatisfaction vary from place to place and from person to person. And we can see vastly different rates of, we'll use the metric of physician burnout in different specialties. But we understand implicitly that different specialties operate in different ways and maybe have different personalities uh, that would attract them. 
So there's something to do with the environment that we work and the dynamics of that environment and the fact that they're different between different specialties and areas that are driving more dissatisfaction amongst those. But we all know of a particular person that we've worked with in the past who was a leader and a mentor who allowed you to do the work that you wanted to do, to be closer to the physician that you had wanted yourself to be. Um, and you didn't mind working incredibly hard because that was your purpose. That was where you found agency in what you do. And that's the key is creating a cultural ethos change. Understandably, there are core features that are somewhat out of our control as physicians, even in healthcare groups and organizations. Um, when you have top-down regulation of certain things you need to do with the EMR. But the issues with the EMR aren't necessarily the fact that we have to tick boxes or fill in forms. It's the fact that it takes us away from doing the thing that we feel that is what it means to us to be a doctor. And that's, that's the key component. There will always be issues with the EMR, but it's about trying to work together and trying to minimize those. Um, so it's, there, there will never be a perfect solution. And each individual in an organization has to do a root cause analysis as to what is driving the dissatisfaction within their organization and how they can best address it. Sure. And, and that, first off, that was an amazing response. I'm going to have to review that a couple of times. Um, one thing that came up just at the tail end of what you stated was this, uh, the EMR kind of getting in the way. And you had written um, in, in terms of burnout about the difference between your job and, and the, the work you love. Can you explain that a little bit? So uh, this, is, this is something that uh, really you know, has been described uh, from time eternity in terms of the philosophical approaches to how you, you view what you do with your, your life. Um, but the person who really kind of brought it up to me was Dyke Drummond, who's also a, a physician who, who works in the, in the burnout space. And it was very much a revelation to me to understand that when we look at what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, we tend to put it in one category in terms of this is what we do. And ultimately, it's not one thing, it's two things. It is both the art of medicine and the work of medicine. The art of medicine is the thing that truly drives you. It's the passion you have for those times when it's just fantastic to be a physician and to intersect with patients at a time that is so critical in their lives. And it is such a privileged opportunity to have that. The work of medicine is a lot of the stuff that goes around that. It's the call rota. It's the EMR. It's the board certifications and maintenance of certification. Ultimately, we truly love the art of medicine and all continue to do so. But we dislike a lot of the elements and the work of medicine. But what happens is, is when we start to feel a disdain towards this, we put the two of them together and we have then a dislike or a disdain we feel for the art of medicine, the thing that we truly love. And we feel huge guilt around that. And we can't understand why we feel guilty for disliking something that we, we hold so dear. And it, it creates huge conflict because we don't understand. But when you begin to parse out the problem in terms of recognizing that the art of medicine is always there and it is something that you truly love and nobody can touch that, but the elements that exist around your job where you work, how you work, the type of specialty that you're in, the people that you work with, the call rota that you have. These are elements of your job that are modifiable. And when you start out your training, you have less scope on this. You have less control and flexibility. But as you move through your training to your own independence, it is up to you to define what you believe are the components of your job, the parts of your work that you want to do most of. 
And you do that because then you can craft your 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 life and your work in the way that you truly had envisioned it to be. So when you look at your job as a whole, then you, you will find that there are elements that you truly love and that there are elements that maybe you don't particularly love, but the aggregate is worth it. And you learn to craft your, your ideal job and it's, it's a constant process. Uh, that's that's really great, you know. Especially, I'm a medical student, and a lot of listeners will be kind of on the younger, younger side. It's it's great to know that you know, it, it's good to brace ourselves for the fact that we're not going to enjoy certain aspects and processes. However, what we can take away is the fact that it's it's a process to constantly carve and create what we're looking for. That's a really powerful message. Yeah. And I think there, I mean, as a, as a general philosophy in life, um, you will always face adversity. And if you look at the Buddhist fundamentals of where people derive suffering is in this expectation mismatch. So that if you always expect things to be good, um, you will find that you encounter painful times in your life. And therefore you have an expectation mismatch. And because of that, then there is suffering. And there's a, there's a famous line in, in Buddhist uh, psychology or philosophy is that pain is mandatory and suffering is optional. Mm. So to, to understand the distinction between those. Sure. Um, and I actually had written, uh, read a, a book recently with the Dalai Lama and he, th- you just reminded me, um, he speaks about the two arrow theory, which is we can't avoid pain, as you had just discussed. That's the first arrow. In anything, you're going to receive the the pain of of suffering, of physical or emotional stress, and things of those nature that nature. However, the second arrow is our reaction to the pain, um, and that we can control, and that we can work with. So, just very interesting tie in there. And and this is this is has been reiterated. Um, again, from time eternal through our literature, insofar as that if you read Man's Search for Meaning, and he's basically, I think, paraphrasing Nietzsche in this, he describes that, you know, we control everything, uh, we control very little in our lives except how we respond to the situation. Mm-hmm. So that is fundamentally always up to your um, control. And so we need to, to recognize that. Shakespeare writes about it in The Tempest insofar as that he says that nothing is right or wrong, um, only thinking make it so. So you have the control um, to respond to your situations. And we always have that no matter what situation we're in. Wow. And that's and that's really great for, for everyone to hear is, taking back the personal control you have to to react in the way that you want to life. That's very powerful. Um, with that being said, I want to ask you, how do you define happiness? And what is happiness to you? Everybody describes or tries to look at happiness as, as something that you find. Um, and I think that is not really possible. Happiness is something that you create. Um, happiness is something that you you build and work towards. Um, it is fundamentally, I believe, a byproduct of the way that you live your life. Um, people will describe this in the sense of finding meaning in life. And that implies that there is meaning to be found. Um, you, you need to look at it another way, is that you bring meaning out of the world in what you do. You bring happiness out of the world in what you do. Um, You need to ultimately, I think, when people are describing happiness, there's there's how we are in the moment in terms of um, your immediate day-to-day or minute-to-minute happiness. And then there is your contemplation over how you feel you are in general. Ultimately, and, and this is one of the distinctions when you look at the, the actual happiness scores in terms of whether having children um, make you happier or not compared to people who don't have children. Mm-hmm. Um, if you survey people 
at the time when they have children and ask them, are they particularly happy? A lot of the time they're not, they're in the middle of some crazy situation and they're stressed and they just go, I just, you know, want some free time. But when you ask them in a, in an overall sense, are you happy that you had children? Are you happy about your life and the way things are? They are happy. So it's to understand the, dis the distinction between what I like to call the weather and the climate. Mm. The weather will always change. It, it just, that is part and parcel of, of life. But you need to try and pitch to where your climate is in, in terms of whether you are generally happy with the world. Mm. And that is fundamentally up to you. Because to find happiness means that, in a sense, that you have to luckily stumble upon it or that it will select you. But when you take ownership over the fact that you can work towards finding happiness, that you can really put a plan in place and have a toolkit um, for finding happiness, that the onus is on you. So therefore, you take control over that. Um and it's it's about perspective and it's a byproduct of the way that you live your life wow i mean that that was a fantastic answer um i think you know something a resounding theme you know uh, connecting this in with what we previously spoke about in terms of burnout uh, there's this tremendous sense of need to find control in the situation and the the fact that we have the ability to to take ownership and control and that's and that's one of the the key drivers um of of dissatisfaction in general and for for burnout which by no means is, is exclusive to to physicians um when you look at the classic survey instruments that are used to describe burnout um the most commonly used is the maslock burnout inventory and that's what you'll often see quoted in the studies or a variant of it but all that does is it tells you whether someone is feeling burned out or is at high risk for uh, becoming burned out or not. So effectively, that just gives you the temperature. It tells you in, a, in an almost binary sense, yes or no. But it says nothing really as to what the root cause of the drivers are. And this is, this is important because without understanding the root cause, it's effectively just looking at a at a temperature of a patient and not understanding the true pathology of where that may be coming from and whether it is indeed sepsis or which organ it is coming from. And when you look then at the survey tools and instruments that are available for defining the causes, the most commonly used is, is again defined by Christina Maslach, um, is the area of work-life survey. And when you look at the rank order of these, Excess work hours or excess demands on the capacity that you have, that tends to be perceived as the number one driver. But invariably, it's actually at the very bottom. The reason it's perceived as the number one driver is that the excess work hours become probably your biggest issue when you are feeling burned out. So it's the most obviously manifest symptom. The two biggest drivers are this lack of control, and that's a lack of control in terms of how you deliver care. That's a lack of control in terms of how you can uh, live your life. It's a lack of control of where you perceive your future and your career to be heading, and this fear that you're being railroaded into a life that you're terrified to have and that you feel that you have no control over this direction. The second is, and it is equally important, is this concept of value conflicts. And what that means is, is that you have a major conflict personally with the institution or organization uh, and their own philosophies and beliefs. And my acid test for this is if you're working somewhere and you feel burned out, pick up or look online, look at your organization's mission statement and read the first line. And if you throw your eyes up and say, that's, that's kind of nonsense, you have a personal value conflict with the way that you believe the organization delivers care. 
the way you believe people should be treated. And this is the problem, is that if you are in a system whereby you feel that patients are being treated unfairly or are being you know, utilized to generate RVUs, for example, or do certain things where you believe it's not the best thing for the patient or that they deserve better, that creates a huge value conflict. And these are often the, the deepest drivers of what actually causes discontent. And the flip side to that is, is that when we then look at the most manifest or visible symptom being an issue around working hours and clearly the working hours has tolerances if someone's working 120 hours a week no one's going to be able to tolerate that but if you then solely and exclusively address that and you try and reduce working hours you don't actually tackle the true fundamental drivers which are likely to be around autonomy and control around value conflicts so you have reduced the time exposure to the adverse stimulus, but you haven't taken away the stimulus. And if you don't fundamentally understand what those, if those are the true drivers for you, you can never orchestrate or put in place a, a, a role or a job that will then be able to make you feel satisfied and engaged with your, your job as a physician. That, yeah, that's uh, an amazing response. And what I, what I think is interesting, just extrapolating from what you stated, is, you know, this sense of burnout, um, you know, it can really happen in any field where you feel this incongruency between your values and what you're doing, um, and as well as the control. Um, so it's a very applicable lesson in, in all fields. And, and, and burnout, as I, as I said, is, is not in any way exclusive to to physicians. Um, burnout uh, originally was described by a, a German gentleman, I can't remember his name, and it was effectively first described in those um, caring for individuals with drug addiction. And so it's most commonly seen in anyone who is in a role who cares for another and can be seen effectively in anyone who deals with other human beings. Um, so that's effectively almost all jobs. So we have certain expectations in terms of we go into our lives as physicians wanting to do well for our patients. And sometimes we feel limited in our ability to do that. And that creates huge conflict. And, you know, it's a, it, it's, it's a tricky position. But burnout is something that is seen um, across the spectrum from nurses to teachers to lawyers to firefighters to police officers um, it's, it, it's something that is, is, is very ubiquitous. Sure. Um, w one question that comes to mind and, and is something kind of fundamental within my own podcast is the ability to create. And as, as we kind of discussed earlier, you know, we, we said we create our happiness. One thing that I've noticed within the culture of medicine, at least from my perspective, is there's a is a underlying fear of expressing your views. I've had friends say that they don't understand how I can start to create things like this. Aren't you worried about what residencies will think of you? Aren't you worried about what others will think of you? But I think that that philosophy and thought process continues no matter where you are on on the continuum of of medicine. So what are your thoughts on fear and creation and how do we um, enhance our voice? I think that's having a confidence in your own belief structures that are, are, are sound and reasonable. Um, I think it is about using the right platform at the right time and the right voice. Um, I think there is a way to have a rational discourse and talk about sensitive topics. And I think often it's something that is grossly lacking in the world today is the idea that we would have a rational discourse over a topic that maybe is not agreed on by two parties. And it is only by having that discourse and having rational discourse that a reasonable solution can be found. And I think one of the most valuable things is to, to try and understand where someone else is coming from and truly understand that. And then you will recognize their fears because often where you're coming 
from is driven by fears, anxieties, and insecurities. And it's been met on the other side also. And I think it's by being able to recognize those elements that progress can be made. But don't be afraid to voice your opinion. But think carefully about what you're saying and how you're saying it and the root of the motivation to say that. And if it's born out of fear and why that is. And understand when someone retorts to understand that that's probably born out of fear also. Um, but I would certainly encourage everybody to develop their own thoughts independently, read broadly, have an idea, an opinion on the world, not to be opinionated, but understand why things are happening and the way things are set up to basically accept, accept nothing on face value and understand the rationales uh, for the structure of things. So, I mean, I, I think it is so important to, to have your voice in the world. And if you don't have your voice, um, if you simply stand back and say nothing, and when the world collapses around you or things are not going as well as you would have liked, you really are not in a position to complain. Because, I mean, one of the things that I often like to to say to myself and to others who are in a, in a position that they don't like is that you can change your attitude or you can change your geography or both. But if you don't do any of those processes or put those in place, and if after six months you're still complaining, you forfeit the right to complain. Because Sometimes it just requires changing your geography, changing either who you spend your time with, where you spend your time, how you spend your time. But sometimes you can't. If you're in a medical school and you simply can't leave, um, if you need then to look at how you're going to change your attitude and how you respond to the world. So you need to look at building that toolkit in terms of your psychological ability to be able to operate effectively in that world and understand that maybe changing your geography is something that you can't do right now. So that's the only option that's available to you and that you can put a plan in place to have them have a more structured alternate down the road in maybe one year, two years, whatever. But if in six months you're still complaining and you haven't changed your approach to the problem, you are effectively just suffering for yourself and you have done nothing to help yourself. That's uh, that's really great advice, and I, I definitely wanted all the medical students and maybe the, even the the younger doctors to to really take that in because that is essential um, information. I'll have to listen to that again myself. Um, something that you mentioned is is kind of having this plan. Um, it it sort of reminds me of, and this is a question I often ask is. Uh, in terms of books and reading and inspiration, when we take information from others, we are formulating our own blueprints in our minds, so to speak, of how to tackle the world. So who who inspires you? Um, who are your heroes, favorite authors, bloggers, and resources you could recommend to people who are listening in? For me, um, I, I think currently there's an obsession with the new. Um, the problems we face are as old as human behavior. Um, so the books I've currently been reading are older and older books. For me, it's, it's about philosophy and understanding and having a, a framework to view the world and how to operate within it. Um, so I think one of the most valuable resources that I think everybody should do um, is watch the there's now probably, I'd say, at least 100 short videos by the School of Life, and that's Alain de Boitin. He's a British philosopher, um, and they're really short, maybe sometimes three minutes up to seven minutes, animated uh, videos on philosophy and how we look at the world. The But he is, although that is a, a new item, he's talking about very old ideas. Um, in terms of um, a book, I think... For anybody who is struggling with a dilemma, and a dilemma is something that doesn't have an immediate and obvious solution, and we talk about touching the two horns of a dilemma, insofar as that if you touch one, you're moving further away from the other, and I think everybody is um, struggling with that. 
the, the book for me that has been the most important is, is a book by Stephen Cope called The Great Work of Your Life. And it's effectively a modern day interpretation of an old uh, Vedic text uh, called the Bhagavad Gita. Um, which is the story of Arjuna and Krishna on the battlefield. And it's about how to deal with a situation whereby if you think you're going to choose something, that you feel that you will pay a penalty in some other way and vice versa. And it's about how to rationalize that in your mind. And ultimately, all of that is driven by fear. So I think, you know, the understanding of the core tenets of philosophy, um, the school of life, um, I think anything in the Stoic philosophy categories, particularly Marcus Aurelius or Seneca, um, just unbelievable in terms of how to look at the world. Um, and also Stephen Cope's book, um, uh, The Great Work of Your Life. Amazing. I'll uh, definitely have to look into those uh, resources myself. Um, one question I like to ask ever, every interviewee is, um, if you could speak to a younger Patty let's say like 10 years ago, what would you say to yourself? I think the, um, I, I wouldn't change anything. I, I think where I am now is a result of all the good and bad things that have happened to me. Um, I think the characters and people that we become are forged from our life's journeys. And I don't think... I would like to say anything in particular um, because it would change potentially who I am now. But one of the most fundamental things I would like to, I try and re reiterate to myself or would try and reiterate to a younger me um, is that it's going to be okay. Um, and things will just be okay. And because it's, it's a matter of how you view it. Um, but I, I think that's, that would be the most important thing for me. Great. Wow. What would you like to say to all of the listeners, to the medical community at large, something you'd like us to conclude with? I think my main message is that uh, although I have a podcast that talks very much about physician burnout, is that it was motivated by the idea that you can have a very fulfilling and satisfying career as a physician, that people do have incredibly satisfying careers as physicians, even within this environment. And that opportunity is always there for you. And that is why you have taken all the exams and put in all this hard work. The reality is to secure that, you have to take a control over your personal world in terms of how you look at the world and how you structure it. And understanding that you can take back that control of the direction of what you're doing and to dictate that you will have a satisfying and engaged career and to know that that's possible to understand that there will be certain things that you cannot change. And if you cannot change them, you cannot worry about them, but understand that you're the one who is in control and you can have those items, but give yourself the toolkit to achieve them. Amazing. Well, with that, ladies and folks, that is Dr. Patty Barrett. It was a true pleasure to have you on the podcast today. And uh, sincerely, you provided some fantastic wisdom. Thanks very much. Hey, guys, thank you so much for listening into this episode. It was a blast to record. If you have any comments or feedback, send me a message to any of my channels. The Facebook page is www facebook.com slash the happy doc the twitter account is the happy doc one the instagram account is the happy doc one you can send me an email to the happy doc one at gmail.com and now i have something to ask of you if you are with my mission of elevating the space of medical care and the medical community if you are with my mission of elevating the positivity that is within the space then please comment like and share this material. Have a great week, guys, and tune in to a new episode every Sunday.